Thank you so much for being here. Welcome, everyone. I want to begin with a statement of support that Sharsheret stands with Israel and hopes for lasting peace as we continue to provide vital cancer education and support. Tonight, we are here to explore a topic that often gets overlooked. Those of us here tonight understand that a cancer diagnosis doesn't just impact the patient. It impacts partners and parents, children and spouses, best friends, and more. And while the focus is on the person diagnosed, caregivers also need support. They need support to help process their own emotions surrounding the diagnosis of a loved one, and they need support to have their own needs met. And that's what we're gonna to explore tonight. Before we begin, as always, a few housekeeping items. First, I wanna thank the sponsors of tonight's webinar, the Florence and Lawrence Spungen Family Foundation, GSK, and Daiichi Sankyo. Their generosity allows us to continue to offer important and educational webinars such as tonight's program. A reminder that we are recording this evening's webinar and it will be posted on our website along with a transcript. Of course, participants' names and faces will not be in the recording. We've received some great questions through the registration process, but I am sure there will be questions that arise during the presentations. So please use the chat box and we will monitor it and address those questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. As a reminder, Sharsheret has been providing telehealth services to the breast and ovarian cancer communities for over 20 years because cancer is so much more than a physical experience. In addition to our many programs to help women and their families navigate different aspects of the cancer experience, I want to highlight one specific one this evening, our free family focus program, which is designed specifically to meet the needs of all types of caregivers. If you are interested in learning more about that kit or ordering one, there is a link in the chat box right now. Thank you, Sarah, um, so that you can learn more and place an order. As we move into the webinar itself, I also want to remind you that Charcheret is a national not-for-profit organization that provides support and education, but no medical advice or perform any medical procedures. The information provided by Char Sharet and tonight's speakers is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment for your specific condition. You should use the should not use the information tonight to diagnose or treat a problem. As always, seek the advice of your physician or a qualified healthcare provider. Before we get to tonight's expert, we are so lucky to have with us Holly and David. Can we get them onto the screen? They worked together to get through Holly's diagnosis. Welcome and thank you so much for agreeing to share your story with us this evening. So let me start with a question for both of you. Um, because I think you might have different perspectives. How does a relationship change when a spouse is sick? We're Should starting I go with the first? <laughs> starting with the easy one. The easy one. I don't know which <laughs> one that is. Um, well, as the caregiver, I guess I'll go first. Um, it's obviously extremely difficult. And I think a lot of it will depend, first of all, on what your relationship is like beforehand. So all relationships are complex and there are wonderful things in them. And often there are things that need to be worked on or maybe haven't been dealt with. And something like this, you know, horrible cancer diagnosis, I'll just be frank about it, will exaggerate both of those things. So What's important to do is to focus on the good part, but that's often hard to find. So for me, I really felt like 
in terms of relationship that my wonderful wife was right next to me, but she actually wasn't there. And I felt like I lost her even though she was next to me. And that was very, very difficult for me to deal with. So that would be the simple answer. Yeah. Not so simple. Holly? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, the first time I was diagnosed with cancer, it's just a scary tunnel that you go into. And um, about four and a half years later, I had a recurrence. And again, you're back in that place of um, sort of feeling like you're fighting, fighting for your life. And so everything gets pushed to the side. Um, and there's just so much inner chatter that goes on that, that isn't shared with your spouse. Um, so many worries in that, because you're also trying to protect your spouse. And I probably checked out there for a while. I was like, okay, I've just got to fight this thing, fight this thing, fight this thing. I think that was very hard for us both. And I think there were times when little things in any relationship when you have something like cancer it goes from like from being this little crack to being this huge crevice and it just sort of blows everything up and I think one of the things that, that sort of helped me through was just remembering that this is temporary right you know I felt happy before so I could feel happy again you know even if today's tough and and I'm struggling with our relationship. I know so we can have good times again. This is just a temporary thing, but it was hard, very hard. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that's a, a great thing to keep in mind. I, I think that's an important piece of advice. David, what strategies did you use to manage your stress as a caregiver specifically? So for me, that's a tricky question because. I think I've lived under stress for a very long time and just learned how to deal with it or thought I did. So, you know, I'm a tough guy until I'm not a tough guy anymore. Um, what was fascinating to me is with all, all the scary stuff and all the physical pain and all the stress and all the horror, something that came over me very early on was this feeling of how blessed I was to have someone that I loved as much as Holly to be able and to want to go and do all these things for her. And I remember my rabbi tried to come and talk to me and he asked me how I felt and I told him that and he couldn't process it. But that, so that helped me a lot, just the realization that it was actually a blessing to be able to help somebody like that. Um, trying to focus on you know, realizing that I shouldn't take, it's hard to, but that I shouldn't take this personally. Like Holly was in so much pain and so focused and so distracted that some of the little things she talked about that became a crevice, I did start to take it personally. And then I said, no, wait a minute. It's not about me. I know she loves me. She's just in so much pain. I can't even imagine. So Basically, just trying to trying to help and keep the relationship going. Uh, probably the main things I did initially. The second time, I had to reach out to caregiver groups. We can talk about that later. Oh, I did need okay. more help the second time. Okay, that is uh, something we should get back to for sure. Can you both talk about um, what role communication played? and having each of your needs met through both of these experiences? Gosh. Um, I can start if you want. No, I, was, I was just thinking through, uh, sometimes I find it easier to write my thoughts and feelings than, than to physically speak them. Um, and so one strategy that helped me specifically sometimes, like if we had miscommunicated was just putting things down in a text and sending it as a text because that way I could have my thoughts clearly ordered um, and say exactly what I meant to say and I think that sounds very hard for me at least to do when the other person's sitting there in front of me I need sometimes a little distance to step back and do that and the hardest part in the beginning 
was the first time I think I was diagnosed and, 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 you know, David and I have talked a little about this, um, but he just didn't want to believe it was cancer. And I just felt the lump and I knew it was cancer. And I, you know, when people say what was the hardest part of your marriage in general, it was sort of those six weeks from finding the lump to being diagnosed where I just felt like I can't really talk to anyone about this because I'm in this sort of no man's gray area but I know what's going on with my body. And that was really difficult um, feeling, feeling that. And we had to do a lot of processing a, a, around that and talk a lot about like, how could we have handled it? And, um, you know, David was like, I just didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe the person that I loved was going to be this because, you know, my mother had also had um, breast cancer uh, 10 years prior to my first diagnosis and it, as her primary caregiver I'd seen sort of what had gone on there and the difficulties she was going through and it was it was a tough journey yeah so I think that that was hard but uh you you learn to communicate better as you go through things and you don't have to get it right sometimes good is good enough right so yeah. yes. I'm huge on um good is good enough and and we'll work the rest out as long as we remember that we have like good intention and that we do have a strong relationship and do love each other, then the daily bumps are sort of bumps. They don't have to be Mount Everest for me. That's a great thing to keep in mind. So you talked a bit about how the diagnostic process was particularly difficult. And David, you alluded to earlier that during the recurrence, you it was a little bit harder for you. So can you tell us a little bit about maybe why you think it was more difficult and how you dealt with the stress of that through reaching out to other resources? I think I didn't deal with the stress of the first time really until the second time. And the communication, this ties in with it because that's obviously critical, but it's so difficult because now from the caregiver's point of view, I felt like I had to be strong and I had to be tough. And if I was gonna cry, it couldn't be in front of her because that would be bad for her. Um, and I sort of managed to do that for a number of years. But the second time I finally realized that I'd been doing this for five years and, and I broke down. And that was actually a communication breakthrough. And so, it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult line to, to walk. But when that happened, then I was able to reach out to Sherrod, among others, which was brilliant, and, and other groups here where we live. Right. And, and social workers and, and get some help with that. And then Holly said something fascinating to me, something along the lines of, you know, I always knew you loved me, but I didn't realize how much you loved me till I saw you cry. So that fact of losing that control actually brought us closer together. And then, you know, and then we went out and fought some more and did what we had to do. But right. that was an important breakthrough for me. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like it, it would be, you know, I often think that, um, it's more difficult for the caregivers, you know, as a patient, we are doing all we need to do to make sure we get healthy and listen to the doctor's orders. We've got our, our marching orders, so to speak. And it's the caregivers who want to help us and often feel like they wish there was more for them to do to ensure a, a, a positive outcome. So thank you for, for all you do. And um I, if you don't mind, there might be questions at the end. I hope you'll hang around. Um, and, sure. um, you, you know, you mentioned that um, you mentioned that you utilize social workers. So that is a, a beautiful segue into the next part of tonight's program. Um, but again, thank you so very much. So now I want to introduce you um, to tonight's expert speaker. Uh, Jennifer Almanyana is a licensed clinical social worker and a certified oncology social worker. She received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's of social work from NYU. 
Jennifer completed a postgraduate training at the National Institute for Psychotherapies in Manhattan. She has a private practice, JSA Psychotherapy, and provides counseling to individuals experiencing anxiety, depression, life transitions, and relationship mm -hmm. issues. She specializes in caregiver issues and facilitates a local caregiver support group. She is passionate about supporting and advocating for clients and their families and aims to make sure her clients feel safe and comfortable as they're exploring their stressors. She helps them to process feelings and learn new ways to cope with and overcome the issues that bring them to therapy. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you all for having me and for listening and for being vulnerable. Um, so I am going to share my screen here. Um, okay, can you confirm that you can see this? We are good. Okay, let me see if I can, hold on, I'm gonna have to stop sharing just so I can move this to my screen, okay. All right, so I can't see anyone. So if anyone's like raising their hand or something, just let me know and I'll- We'll move. keep you, yes, we'll let you know. Okay, and let me know time-wise too. I appreciate it. You got it. So as you introduced me, I'm Jen. That's what most people call me. Um, you went through my resume, so I appreciate it. I am part of, so I'm coming from Florida. I'm in South Florida. I know everyone's from all over the place. Um, I am part of the Florida Oncology uh, Society of Oncology Social Workers. It's an organization down here that helps us connect um, to other oncology social workers. I did work in hospital settings for about 10 years um, and worked part-time in private practice. And since I had my son two years ago, I am now full-time in private practice. Throughout my time working um, in hospital settings, inpatient and outpatient, and especially with oncology uh, patients and their families, I noticed that there was a lot of times or most of the time where there's so much focus on the patient themselves and what they're going through. And a lot of times people aren't doctors, nurses, um, dietitians and whoever is interacting with the family, um, no one's asking the caregiver, how are you doing? What's going on with you? How are you coping? And I found that to be um, challenging because anyone who's in this situation knows that the caregiver struggles and this impacts family members just as much or differently as it does um, the patient and it's sometimes a family disease. So I think it's really important, um, at least in my opinion, uh, for the caregiver to be acknowledged, to be recognized, and to be cared for as well. So when we talk about caregivers, um, there are so many different types of caregivers out there, but for the purpose of this uh, presentation and for this um, webinar, we are talking about the primary caregiver. So we're talking about a family member, a significant other, um, husband, wife, partner, child, parent, sibling, grandparent. Um, so it could be anybody in, in the family. I see sometimes neighbors are the primary caregiver um, or a best friend can be the primary caregiver. So depending on um, who's the closest to the patient. Of course, caregivers can be the physician, medical team, social workers, et cetera. But here we're talking about that primary caregiver. So just a few facts that I think are important to recognize. Um, this is from um, AARP Family Caregiving and the National Alliance for Caregiving. Um, the caregiving in the United States in 2020, um, the amount of caregiving that has gone up since 2015 is huge. Um, 43.5 million caregivers in 2015 to 53 million in 2020. Um, Nearly one in five are providing unpaid care to an adult with health or functional needs. Um, the more family caregivers report their own health is fair to poor. So we will talk about a little bit how emotional and 
physical, so emotional and psychological stress can really impact our physical, um, our physical stress, which then can cause health issues. And then we're talking about how can we take care of others if we're not able to take care of ourselves. Um, who are today's family caregivers? 61% are female. Um, something else that's impactful to see is that 45% have had at least one financial impact um, when they're caregivers. And 61% are working people. And we have a huge impact on work itself. If we're so busy caregiving, a lot of people uh, have an impact on their work. So just some statistics I like to add in there. So caregiving roles, um, it's huge here, right? We're thrown into this caregiver role. We find out a diagnosis of cancer and we're like, what happens now? What do I have to do for my loved one? We're doing things like managing patients' medical care, insurance claims, bill payments, acting as a companion to the patient, going with the patients to doctor's appointments, running personal errands, cooking, cleaning, doing other housekeeping chores, finding doctors and specialists, finding resources for the patient's needs, helping them connect with other family, friends, neighbors, and community members. So as you we were talking about before, what was the role changes that happened? I see this a lot in relationships. Um, maybe one spouse, if we're talking about spouses here, um, or partners, one spouse used to do, let's say the finances in the house and the other spouse did the cooking and cleaning. And now that one spouse that's a caregiver is doing everything. Um, that's a big change in the household. And that can be really hard to adjust to. And so it's really important for you to have compassion for each other in those situations to say, okay, now our roles have changed in the family. Um, so just important to note there with the caregiver roles. Caregiver roles also include decision-making, uh, being the decision maker, the patient advocate and communicator. It's so important when we're, let's say in doctor's appointments um, that you're advocating for the person that you're caring for. So emotional, financial, psychological and physical effects of caregiving, it's a lot. I love this graphic um, of Atlas, the, world is on your shoulders. A lot of times when we're caregiving for a loved one, we feel like we have so much on us. It feels like a huge weight on our shoulders. And we have to find a way to take that weight off our shoulders. I know you were saying that, you know, sometimes it's like, it feels in some ways like a pleasure to take care of our loved ones. And then other days it may feel like, I don't know what to do next. And this is so overwhelming. So I like this graphic, excuse me. I like this graphic because it really puts into play how stress can impact our mind, our body, our emotions, and our behaviors. I'm hoping that this can resonate with you if you are a caregiver or even if you are a patient um, because everyone's going through stress, especially when it comes to cancer. Um, our body, we can experience things like headaches, um, it's not on here, but gastro and, uh, gastro issues, um, infections, tight muscles, fatigue, breathlessness in our mind. We may be worrying, muddled thinking, impaired judgment. We may have nightmares, indecision. So when we were talking about being that decision maker, a lot of times I hear my clients tell me, I just, I'm having so many, so much difficulty making decisions. I'm having concentration issues. That's really common when we're dealing with um, high stress situations where we have trouble making decisions or trouble concentrating. It's also part of depression. Um, behavior accident prone. We always tell people if you are under a lot of stress or experiencing depression and anxiety, be extra careful, especially when you're driving. If you are having an anxiety attack, or you are distracted, we don't want you to drive because you may uh, have an accident. We want to be very careful. Uh, behaviorally, loss of appetite, loss of sex drive. You may be drinking more. You may be smoking more. You may start doing drugs if you're prone to do that. 
Um, this is something that happens when we're extra stressed. Emotions, we're going to talk a lot more about this, but things like irritability, apathy, um, isolation, anxiety. So more emotions and symptoms of what we call caregiver burnout. I know this is going to resonate with you, okay? Denial. I think we talked about this a little bit before. And Holly was saying like something is in the beginning of a diagnosis or when you know you're gonna be, I can't believe this is happening to me. Um, shock, anger, social withdrawal, sadness, tearfulness, grief. This is a big one. A lot of times when we're diagnosed with any type of medical illness, but especially cancer, we're grieving not just grief doesn't just have to do with death. Grief has to do with the loss of what was, the loss of what could have been, the loss of what we thought we were dealing with, um, the loss of our roles. So we're grieving. So it's definitely something to keep in mind and to name uh, what we're coping with. Frustration, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, very common. Um, anxiety, confusion, feelings of depressed mood, emotional and physical exhaustion for sure. Some sleeplessness, irritability. Um, I think you guys were talking about, we may get irritable and uh, snap at each other at different times. Um, lack of concentration some health problems. I hear a lot of people have, you know, blood pressure issues um, that get exacerbated during high stress times and appetite changes, whether you're eating more or eating a lot less, um, that definitely happens during uh, when someone's a caregiver or have a caregiver burnout. I will say, although this lecture is talking about caregiver burnout, this happens with caregivers or this happens with patients. This is not also, I do this presentation, not just with oncology, but with other caregivers uh, for other health related issues or even dementia. Um, so some people on here may have um, an elderly parent or a friend who's dealing with other medical issues um, or neurocognitive issues too. So this would be relevant and it's something to take with you as well. So financial concerns, I'm going to pass through this quickly, but just to be aware of, of course, you know, everything from insurance coverage and co-pays and medication costs, travel costs, financial assistance needs. This is a huge stressor for people. Um, we want to make sure that we look for solutions like staying organized, asking for help, looking into if we have long-term care insurance, meeting with a financial advisor, addressing things like our advanced planning documents. Um, the hospital that I worked at, they had a financial counselor to meet with, um, meeting with a social worker like myself for resources. There are so many resources out there in organizations. Sometimes it's just a matter of finding those resources and tapping into them um, to get the resources that you need. And even just asking about payment plans. So we're talking about all these intense emotions and psychological um, impacts of caregiver burnout. How do we prevent it? How do we treat it? So self-care is a big buzzword, but it's really true that we need to care for ourselves. We need to love ourselves. We need to feel compassion for ourselves and understand that this is what Holly was saying is it's temporary, but it also is painful. And so if we can give ourselves the grace and give ourselves some love and use some tools to help us to get through these tough times. So some of the tools include some relaxation techniques. Um, Find, and we'll go over some of those, finding time for yourself, respite care. So this is even finding someone, a friend or family member to sit with your loved one while you go out um, and do something you enjoy, even if it's just taking a walk or going to lunch with a friend or um, 
if your loved one is too sick to even do that, there is, at least in my area, um, something actually called respite care where the person who's ill can go into a facility for a week or two. Um, there's also the ability to, um, well, that's respite care. So I just wanted to put that in there. So it's really about finding time for yourself. Yoga, that's an amazing source of um, calm and self-care. Uh, you don't have to be flexible or a yogi to benefit from yoga. It can be sit down and stretching. It can be, be uh, breath work. Um, you can go on YouTube and find yoga for beginners and really just take some time for yourself. Psychotherapy and support groups. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, any type of exercise, I'm talking about going on the stairs instead of an elevator, I'm talking, taking a walk around the block for five, 10 minutes in between, um, you know, if you work, uh, just to take a break. Um, it doesn't have to be intense exercise, uh, sleep, making sure you have adequate sleep. I know it's really hard when we're stressed, um, but sleep hygiene is huge. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Healthy eating habits, acupuncture. Um, acupuncture is a beautiful way to take care of yourself. Find a local acupuncturist. Um, most of them are definitely well-versed for oncology patients themselves and for caregivers. Massage therapy and taking a bath. So here are four different types of relaxation techniques that I love to use with my clients. One of them is visualization. Today, I don't think we have enough time, but usually when I do these lectures, I will do a visualization technique. Um, but just really quickly, it's something that you can do at home with yourself. Um, and it's literally sitting, closing your eyes and thinking about either some place that you have been or some place you wanted to go or something in your imagination and visualizing. So I'm just gonna give an example because I live by the beach. Of closing your eyes and you're going through your senses. So you're gonna think of, for instance, the beach. You're gonna think of being on the beach you're gonna think of your sight. So what do you see? I see the ocean in front of me. I see the trees, uh, leaves blowing back and forth. Um, I see kids running around. I see um, a little crab on, on the sand. Uh, and I see um, my husband laying on the beach chair over there. And then you're going to say, what do I smell? I smell the ocean air. I smell, um, I smell the sea. And then you're going to say to yourself, what do I hear? I hear the waves crashing. I hear the sound of the seagulls and I hear, um, some kids yelling, you know, yelling for their dad. So we're going through our senses. Okay. And then you're doing some breathing within it and you're doing a full visualization for yourself. And this can take you out of your anxious mind into your body and into basically a different place. So we can visualize everything from a relaxation place of a beach. Um, I had a client give me uh, one on a hike that they took um, in a remote area um, in a place that I've never even heard of. Um, so you can really visualize yourself anywhere, but you're really looking to work on all of your senses. Breathing exercises. Um, we will do one of them in a moment. Um, progressive muscle relaxation. This is when you go through your whole body. You start with your toes and up to your head and you will start with your toes and you will squeeze your toes and relax. You can squeeze your feet together and you relax. Squeeze your calves and relax. Um, and you're basically squeezing as many muscles as you can, starting with your toes up into your face, even just squeezing your face like this. I know it looks funny and relax. And so that's called progressive muscle relaxation. That's another relaxation technique um, to really, again, you're focusing on your body rather than what's going on in your mind um, and you're breathing throughout these uh, exercises. 
Um, a lot of these exercises you can find, and I will show you at the end on, I think most of you are probably tech savvy. You were able to get on the Zoom tonight. Um, you can find them either on an app um, or even on YouTube. If you can just put in progressive muscle relaxation, uh, uh, meditation or uh, techniques, and you can find it guided, which I think especially to start is a really um, helpful way so that you can try them uh, without having to do it all on your own. Um, at the end, I'll have my information. You can also always reach out to me uh, and I can help guide you through them and give you some other resources. Uh, meditation, let me see if I have anything here. Um, meditation is always a great way to help to relax. Meditation does not have to be where we sit in silence um, and have our minds be completely clear. That's not, that's a type of meditation, but that is not all the meditation. These visualization exercises, breathing exercises, progressive muscle relaxation, those are all types of meditation. Grounding exercises. Um, grounding exercises basically just means they're grounding you from your anxious mind into the here and now. We're just going to ground you to the present moment. Um, one of the grounding exercises that I like is when I'm very anxious or I find myself overthinking um, is counting backwards from 100 by 7. It's a little difficult. And so when you're doing that, you're really not able to pay attention to anything else. If you are a math guru, let's not do the 100 by seven. Um, we can do something like categories. So you think of a category, let's say movies. Um, and within movies, you're going to think of five horror movies and then five comedy movies. And so you say them out loud and you just go through different categories. This is another way to calm yourself um, or ground yourself to the present moment because you're going to stop thinking about all the things that we're anxious about and start being in the present moment thinking about categories, for instance. Um, all right. Breathing techniques. How am I doing on time? You have five more minutes. <laughs> okay. If these I know I'm talking quickly. <laughs> so if these tech, we could also include some of this, uh, the technique parts in a follow-up email if you Great. have other content you want to get out. Okay. So we can do that. I have a list of breathing techniques I will send out. So we will skip over this. Um, I will tell you that this breathing technique is probably the best one out there. Um, it is proven to help. Uh, many of you have probably heard of fight or flight. Um, that is your sympathetic nervous system. Um, and we want to go from this fight or flight to rest and digest, which is your parasympathetic nervous system. One of the best ways to do it is breathing, but there are certain types of breathing exercises to do that. And one is called the four, seven, eight breath. And that is breathing in for a count of four through your nose, holding for a count of seven and breathing out through your mouth for a count of eight. The only reason I wanna do this and just show you one time around is because the way you breathe out for the count of eight is really important so that you access um, your vagal nerve you guys can Google vagal nerve. There's a whole host of information on your vagus nerve uh, online. So you're going to do a breathe and I'm going to do it just very quickly. Okay. You're going to breathe in for four. And you're going to breathe out like this. When you breathe out, when you're making a whooshing sound, when your mouth is basically like a little O, you can breathe out for much longer than when you do this. It's a little bit different. So I just wanna make sure that you see that when you are um, doing this exercise. It allows you to have a longer, slower, deeper breath. Okay. 
All right, I am going to, this is practicing at home. Okay, support groups. So this is our local support groups here in Florida, but I do think it's really important to consider going to a support group as a caregiver. There are so many benefits to support groups. Um, I would say to reach out to Sharsheret, to reach out to American Cancer Society. They always have lists of local support groups in your area. Um, reach out to any of your local churches, synagogues, uh, mosques, or any of your religious institutions. A lot of times, like the synagogue that I, um, uh, the synagogue that I work for and um, and participate or facilitate our support group, um, we anyone can join anyone can join our caregiver group. And I think that it is really, really helpful for all our caregivers to be able to share um, how they're doing, be able to have camaraderie, to be able to feel comforted and um, get support from others who are going through similar things. So people feel less lonely, isolated or judged. Um, it's proven that caregiver support groups can reduce depression, anxiety, or distress. We gain a sense of empowerment and control, um, get suggestions or information about practical solutions or treatment options. We improve learn, or learn healthy coping skills. Um, sometimes I lead my group in these breathing exercises. Um, we get a better understanding of what to expect in the future. Sometimes my clients in the group will talk to each other just directly about, oh, this is what's been going on with my uh, partner. Um, this is what you can expect you know, for this treatment or something like that, even though it may be a different type of treatment, but it's like, this was my experience. Improving caregiving skills and giving better quality of life to your loved one. Learning about ways to keep your loved one at home and or how to best transition them. This is actually more relevant to my memory care clients. Exercise gives you deeper relaxation and enhanced enthusiasm for life. Um, these are some mental health benefits of exercise, enhances mood and energy, and helps us manage stress. Yoga is for everyone. It helps relaxation, our mental health our physical health and connects our mind and body. Uh, yoga really is for everyone, no matter the age, um, your physical abilities. Um, I think it's really important to consider that as a way for self-care. Nutrition, healthy eating. Um, there is a book or a few books on the food mood connection. I encourage you to take a look at those. Um, the food you eat affects your mood, overall health, and your immune system. Eating nutritious, good food is the most basic way to care for yourself, your health, and your well-being. So this is too much to write, to read, but basically saying that eating a well-rounded meals and all your meals, what breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks, um, limiting processed sugar and carbohydrates, um, helps you to sleep better, can help you to have more energy and can really help you to ultimately be a better caregiver. Um, sleep, probably should have started with this because if we are not sleeping, we can really impact our physical health and our mental health. Um, it can cause us to be irritable. It can cause us to um, become just in majorly poor health. So we want to do everything we can to get the best sleep. Um, some suggestions with sleep is that the bed is right here. I, I can't see this. The bed is for sleeping. So a lot of people eat in bed. They watch TV in bed. They are sitting on their phones in bed. Um, it is really important that the bed is, well, they say the bed is for sleeping and for sex. So we want to make sure that even if you want to watch TV, that you're watching TV in the other room, and then we come into bed for sleep. Um, make sure if you're napping, that you're napping before 3 p.m. Um, do your best to um, avoid caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine at least four to six hours before bed. Um, and also to go to bed and wake up at the same time. 
that's something that can be really helpful. If you really have trouble falling asleep um, or staying asleep, I would talk to your doctor about some type of medication um, or natural things like melatonin or magnesium, um, even putting lavender on your bed, under your pillow, something like that. Uh, if you have any questions further about sleep hygiene, you're more than welcome to contact me. One last thing, pets. What a wonderful way to get comfort and love and calm. Um, petting your pets um, is a really great stress reliever. So if you have them, I strongly suggest that you intentionally get comfort from your pets. So the other thing I want to tell you is please don't hesitate to reach out for mental health support. There is nothing wrong with having a therapist or going to a support group. These are some of the resources, um, psychologytoday.com, helloalma.com, BetterHelp. Um, these are all ways to find local therapists near you. Um, American Psychiatric Association does have uh, a website with local psychiatrists, which um, if you're not sure, psychologists or social workers or licensed mental health therapists, those are for therapy and psychiatrists are for medication management. Um, you can also search your insurance company's website to find those who take your insurance. And that is my presentation. I know <laughs> it so quickly because I could speak for a very long time talking about caregiver issues and how to help support caregivers and patients alike. Thank, Thank you so, so much. We, we, you have so much great information there. And yet there are also so many great questions. And I want to get, I, I want to make sure that we do that. So if we could um, leave Jen and myself up here, but also bring the Davies back up here, because there are questions for them as well. Um, that would be amazing. Um, let me, let me um, start off by asking um, a question uh, of Jen and then getting Holly's in, uh, thoughts on this. So one of the, one of the questions is, we know as women, it is, we're so used to doing for others. It's so hard to accept support, to accept care. So, so if you could share first a few thoughts on that, and then we can ask Holly about her experience with it as well. A few thoughts on how it's hard to accept care. How you can when it's so hard and so difficult, when we're used to being the ones that are caring. Um, I mean, I think it starts with kind of the idea of letting go, right? Um, the idea of this is your time. So as a patient, um, the idea of this is your time to accept help and, and to say, you know, what are the things I can do? There's a lot of times I talk to people about control, right? I mean, everyone, you don't have to be, I always say, we don't have to be a control freak to want to be in control. As humans, we want to be in control of our destiny per se, of our, you know, what we get to do with our day-to-day -day and our behaviors and our bodies for sure. And when we have cancer, um, you know, let's say we're getting chemotherapy or radiation or both, like we don't really, you know, we, we know medically what's going in our bodies, but we don't have control. There's so many things we don't have control over. So we think about what are the things we do have control over? We have control over who we say yes to, what we say yes to. We have control over, do we show up for treatment? Um, and so <clears throat> I also start talking about, you know, where do we have control over here? But we have control over, do we ask for help? Can we accept help from our loved ones? And I think some of it is about letting go and saying, you know what, and as a woman to be, you know, I think saying, at least in my situation, like with my spouse, like, let them help you because it's their pleasure to help you. Like they need to have control too, because they're so out of control because they don't know what to do for you. Right. That's so it's interesting. Point. It's like, let them help you because it's helping them. I like that point. Holly, has that, was that your experience? Um, I think it was hardest for me really to accept help from family. 
I have, you know, pretty strong support systems in our community and because I was the person who had given so many years for the community, um, a, p- a couple of people just stepped up and sort of said, hey, this is your time to receive. And they set up meal trains and GoFundMes and all sorts of things to help with um, just the process of treatment. Still the hardest thing was like having to ask, particularly my children for help. Um, yeah, because I'd always been, you know, I was the one who bore them. I nursed okay. them, and now I'm having to ask them, and that was the hardest thing. And it's still difficult to this day. And it's interesting because I have parents who are um, on the other end, and so they're having to rely on me for help, and I'm happy to give it. So I have to sometimes sit back and go, maybe I need to rethink this one through a little and uh, change some of my thoughts around this. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, we have a couple more questions I wanna try and get to. So someone asked in the chat box, um, is it standard practice, um, if if an oncology practice or a hospital has a social worker, is it standard practice for the social worker to see the caregiver as well? And, and is that only alongside the patient or is it possible for them to see the social worker separately too? I mean, I can only speak for where I worked. Um, okay. I had a lot of, I had a lot of free reign where I worked because I was the first, I wasn't the first oncology social worker, but I was the first one to do what I was doing. And I made it clear how important it was to talk to the caregiver. And so I talked with the patient and without the patient and I started support groups. So I started a caregiver support group. So that was kind of how it went in the place that I was. Um, I think every place is different. I I, I don't know. I, I don't think I can answer that in terms of a general policy. Do you think that it's a reasonable request for a caregiver to make to the practice? Absolutely. Yeah. I I think it's definitely a reasonable request. Um, My family member is going through uh, lung cancer treatment up in Chicago and they request. And so a lot of time, I shouldn't say this there. And so I don't want people to get upset when they're not seeing uh, an oncology social worker, like without asking. There are too many in the majority of places I know, there are too many patients and caregivers for the one social worker or two social workers that are at the hospital settings or even at a private practice. A lot of people don't even go to hospital settings. They're going to a private practice setting that may be associated with the hospital. So unless you ask or even know that there are social workers that exist, a lot of times you're not going to be seen. So it's important that you add, it starts with the advocating, it starts with advocating for yourselves or for your loved ones saying, is there a social worker here that I can talk to? And if there is a social worker that I can talk to, what kind of resources does a social worker have in the area for me? So I have a family member who currently is getting treatment for lung cancer and I, at University of Chicago. And I said, have you talked to the social worker? No, I don't even know if there is one. So I Googled it and looked it up for them. And I said, this is the social worker. They're on this floor. She's like, that's where I get chemotherapy. I said, okay. And I noticed it's literally like two steps down from when they're getting chemo. So she asked the nurse to get the social worker. The social worker came in, gave them great resources. And then I told uh, my family member, I said, you're ha- you're struggling. She's the caregiver. So why don't you go talk to her separately about what you're struggling with? So then she went and spoke. So I think it's sometimes about right. like advocating for yourself I and know. doing what you need to do more so than what they're coming to you for. Um, that's what I see a lot with in the situation is that we all need as caregivers to advocate for ourselves and for our loved ones. Okay. David, did you have something you wanted to add there? Well, I was just going to give you my experience, which might be helpful. My experience was the social workers or worker did not approach me. I did not know that that was available to me. It was actually Holly who mentioned to the social worker. Now, whether Holly had to search the social worker out or whether she was approached, I don't know. But Holly had to mention to the social worker that, you know, my husband 
is struggling, can you help him? And then she asked me, did I want to be in touch with that social worker? And the same social worker treated us as two separate clients, essentially. That's so great. I could speak to the social worker as openly as I wanted to, and Holly could as well. And there were a few social workers who did that for us both. And uh, they never, I'm not aware that they ever broke a confidence. That's, that's great. We have a few more questions and not a few more minutes. But um, I, I, so I just, somebody asked an important question, you know, within the Jewish community, those of Ashkenazi descent in particular, sometimes cancers run in a family. So somebody said, you know, I'm a survivor and I'm also my sister's caregiver. I need some suggestions for establishing and maintaining boundaries so I can continue to care for myself. Jennifer, this is very unfair, but you have 90 seconds. <laughs> I don't even know what she's referring to in terms of boundaries, like emotional boundaries, physical boundaries. Like I think yes. The answer to that question is yes. Both is my guess. Um, oh, I'll tell you what. Know. It's a serious question. I think what we're going to do maybe is... Um, I'm happy to do another one of these things. Um, talk about writing a blog about it or something like that. Um, I, think, I think that boundaries in general are really important in terms, and, and uh, we talk about buzzwords, right? Like boundaries are such a buzzword, but they are really important in terms of what do I need to keep myself, for lack of a better word, sane, right? Um, how can I give of myself but also notice, so when we're talking about meditation or mindfulness, like let's notice what's going on in my body. Am I tensing up? Am I crying so much? Am I not sleeping? Am I not eating? Am I not able to function in my relationships? Am I not able to function in my work? Like how do we notice what's happening within us or around us? And then we notice, are we struggling too much? Then we know that we need to put up some kind of boundary. Um, because that's too much for us. I think it's important to recognize when we are doing too much for others or too much in general, and right. when we need to take a step back and say, okay, this is when it's time to put up a boundary. Maybe you need to get some help for the person you're caring for, whether it's for a night or for a week, and you need to go get yourself a massage or you need to go get yourself something else yeah go ahead. so what i hear is you've given every caregiver a permission to set certain boundaries and mm -hmm. and at a different time we will address how to set some of those boundaries um but we do need to um to conclude tonight so once again i want to thank jennifer for sharing her expertise and her passion I found her presentation clarifying and empowering, and I hope you did as well. I want to thank Holly and David. Hearing from people who have been through it, who have been there, makes such an impact. You were both so gracious to share your story with us tonight. And of course, thank you again to our sponsors, the Spungen Family Foundation, GSK, and Daiichi Sankyo. As we near the end of the program, I want to just make you aware of a few upcoming programs. Um, we're going to put in the chat box right now a link to our program page where you can learn more about each of these programs and register for the ones you want. So this Sunday, we're having another one in our series of movement and music programs. Um, it's open to anyone impacted by cancer, including caregivers. On Monday the 13th, our annual health, men's health webinar will address essential cancer screenings for men. This is open to all men and all women who love them. So that could be a spouse, a partner, a daughter, a sister, a mother, or more. And on November 30th, our annual clinical trials webinar will share the latest information about the benefits of trials and how to navigate that process. Again, there was a link in there to learn more about all of them. As we conclude this evening, the evaluation link is now in the chat box. You can click it now and still listen to the last couple of minutes here. 
please take a moment to share your thoughts about tonight's program, topics you'd like to hear about in the future. It is so important um, as we plan future programs. And of course, remember that Charcheret social workers and our genetic counselor are there for you to answer questions, connect you to resources, listen to you vent, provide support, and you can reach our team through the contact information in the chat box right now. That support is available not just to those going through a cancer experience, but all of their caregivers. Thank you so much for being here and have a good night. Bye-bye.